The Zen of Python is a list of 19 essential guiding principles for Python developers. But if you write code in any language, you'll find these interesting. In this video, I'll illustrate each of these principles with a small piece of Python code and discuss what they mean and how you can use them practically when you're developing software or writing scripts. I'll show you how to embrace the Zen of coding in Python. Let's go. I'm Alex, a data engineer and author of the Applied Data Science Workshop which is an introduction to data science and machine learning with scikit-learn and Jupyter Notebooks. I've been coding in Python for almost 10 years and I know a lot about it, but I'm not pretending to know everything. If I got something from the Zen of Python wrong, hop into the comments and let me know why. That way I can highlight that for everyone else watching this video and we can all learn together. Let's go. When we're writing Python code, the Zen of Python is literally right under our fingertips. Here's what I mean. The Zen of Python by Tim Peters. First rule, beautiful is better than ugly. Here's a simple function called greet. In the first example, we have some more beautiful code where we use an F string to embed the variable name in the string that we're printing. The second function accomplishes the exact same thing, but the code isn't as pretty to look at. Here's another example. In the first code block, we're printing a few colors and everything's extremely readable and pleasant to look at. And in the second example, we're accomplishing the same thing, but the code is absolutely awful to look at. Rule number two, explicit is better than implicit. This is good explicit code. We are importing the math library and then using the pi variable inside of that. Here's the same thing which is not done explicitly. We're importing everything from the math library which gives us access to pi in our namespace, but it's not explicit how we did that. In this example, we are overcrowding the global namespace of our Jupyter Notebook with everything inside of the math library. Here's another example. We're explicitly opening this file in read mode, which is better than opening the file like this. Three, simple is better than complex. Here's a simple function that returns the sum of all of the numbers which are passed in. Here's a relatively complex function which does the same thing. Number four, complex is better than complicated. Here's some code that's somewhat complex. We have a list of groceries and a list of fruits, and we're gonna filter down the list of groceries to just those which are fruits. And I can do that with a list comprehension. Here we see just the banana and the orange being picked out. Instead of a one line list comprehension, I have a more complicated way of doing this by iterating over the grocery items and checking for each of them if they are a fruit or not and appending them in the case that they are a fruit. Some people might argue that this is more readable, but I think it illustrates this point in the Zen of Python. Number five, flat is better than nested. Here's a function that has a flat conditional statement about apples and how many of them there are. Here's the same code, but nested. Now in this example, like my previous one, you could argue that the nested one looks better or is more readable. In fact, if I was implementing this, I'd probably do it in a different way completely. What I do is first check if the item is an apple and then raise an error otherwise. From there, I can simply check the number condition. And actually the best way to describe this going forward would be with a case statement with Python's new pattern matching capabilities. Here's another example that I found on Reddit, which clearly indicates this concept. Although I've never seen code as bad as this example, I think this is a mistake which plagues beginners, and I've certainly fallen victim to this before. So keeping in mind that flat is better than nested is a good thing when you're starting out with Python. Number six, sparse is better than dense. So here's some sparse code where we're indicating the name, the age, and then printing that information. Here's the same thing written in a more dense, less Pythonic way. And here's the same thing written even more densely. What we like best is the first one. Sparse is better than dense. Number seven, readability counts. Here's some readable code because of the way the variables are named. There's also nice spaces in between the plus sign, the multiplication sign, and the variables, as well as the equality. Here's some less readable code where the variable names do not give a good indication of what data they represent. Here's some even more less readable code where the variable names are all squashed together with the arithmetic symbols. 
Number eight, special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. So here's a special case where we might wanna write less readable code because it's pretty obvious that T naught indicates a time, the initial time, and then T1 is a later time. And so DT is gonna be the difference between those two times. But this guideline would steer us away from this, instead favoring an option where the variable names are more readable. So something more like this. Number nine, although practicality beats purity. This one seems to conflict directly with the previous guideline, which it does. I would describe this rule as, well, sometimes just say f it. Number 10, errors should never pass silently. In this code, we're trying to open a file, and if we can't do that, then we're catching the error and we're printing that for the user. Here's the equivalent code where we're letting that error go silently. This is a dangerous thing to do. Number 11, unless explicitly silenced. In this case, when we try and open our file, if we get an IO error, then we're passing silently, but we've explicitly checked for this error. You'll notice in this case, I'm explicitly checking afterwards for general exceptions and logging those. Number 12, in the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. I like this one. Here's an example where we're refusing to guess if the age is correct or not. If I run this and I type something like 10, I get a value error because I've passed an invalid age. Here's the anti-pattern where you're assuming the age is a proper integer and trying to parse it directly. 13, there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. Here's an example from the standard library where we're gonna convert this string to lowercase. There's another way of doing this. You could split the strings up into characters and make each of those lowercase before joining them back up again. But this is much less obvious. So in Python, there's really only one obvious way to convert a string to lowercase. Check this out. You can do string.lower, and then I could say greetings in here. I still think this is much less obvious than the first example. And overall, Python does a really good job of having only one obvious way to do things better than some other languages that I've seen. JavaScript. The final guidelines are harder to illustrate with code, so I'm just gonna talk through them. Number 14 is just an inside joke. You can read about that online if you want, but there's certainly no code samples that I could think of to illustrate this. Number 15, now is better than never. Python makes it really simple to prototype code and start writing dirty code quickly. So just go do it, you can clean it up later. But on the other hand, never is often better than right now. So sometimes you might not even need to write the code at all. Although you can prototype and write code really quickly if you need to, it's probably worth sitting down with a pen and pencil and a piece of paper or talking with some people first to get a good sense of what you wanna build before you go in and just start building it. Number 17. If the implementation is hard to explain, then it's a bad idea. We should try and write code that's as simple as possible and easy to explain to others. Number 18 jokingly asserts that if the implementation is easy to explain, it may be a good idea. And lastly, number 19, namespaces are a really good idea. So let's do more of these. To me, this speaks to the isolation provided by functions, and we should be pretty careful about what global variables that we use at the top of our file outside of the function scope. Here's an example of a proper use of namespaces. We're importing the collections library, and then I can access the counter module, but it's tied back to that collections library, so it's obvious that it's part of that namespace. Here's another example of a proper use of namespaces. In this case, I know that I only want the counter of collections, so I'm just gonna import that part of the library. And finally, here's an example of namespace abuse, where we're just loading everything from the collections library, and that includes the counter that we need, but now we get our namespace all cluttered with other stuff that we don't want. And that's it, the 19 guidelines that make up the Zen of Python programming. I hope you find this valuable for writing better code in Python or any language. I've always found that the beauty in programming is not just the solution that I'm able to provide, but the way that I provide it by writing clean code that's easy to read, understand, and maintain. If you like this video and found it informative, please give me a thumbs up and consider subscribing. 
As a new channel, it really helps me get my videos discovered. I've linked a video that you might like here, or you could look at my playlists for other videos that I've made about Python programming. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day and happy coding, and I'll see you in the next one.